also been trying out the game I'm sure everybody wants to buy, and that is the new Command Conquer game for the mobile device. Aw, really? Now somebody tells me. Aw. Mm, mm, mm. Really, I did not see anyone mention that. Hmm. But, uh, while I'm uh, checking things out on this end, so I've been playing the new Command Conquer game just to see how bad it is, and it has some good ideas to it. But it runs into that problem. Let's see. Ah, uh, yeah, so it was on the Hummel Bundle. Eh. Well, we'll have to... Maybe I'll get lucky and something else will pop up. But, with Command & Conquer Rivals, it's running into that same problem that games like Clash of Clans, uh, South Park Film Destroyer, and other strategy S games have with combining abstraction with the monetization system. That you kind of lose strategy if your opponent just has higher level units. And we talked about this a while ago with Age of Empires Online, which I gotta ask, am I the only person who actually played that game? Whether I'm, you're watching this live or recorded right now. Because what they did with Age of Empires Online was they gave... You had different gear that you could equip to your units, which would apply to combat. But in a way, it would basically remove the balance. Like, if I have archers and I give them elite armor, then they're not going to really be countered by low-level cavalry units anymore. So, I just broke the rock-paper-scissors balance. Hey, Elgordo. And then it comes down to... How do you counter units if you break their counter? Well, the answer, of course, is you spend money or you get lucky with the treasures or loot boxes. And that's kind of what I'm running into with Command Conquer Rivals. If I build a lot of vehicle units, and let's say the opponent hasn't leveled up their anti-vehicle infantry, then I'm going to have a very easy time. But if they do have it, or they just spam their highest cost unit, then I'm kind of screwed. And... <laughs> and there's not much you can do. It runs into that same thing that South Park, I'm assuming Clash of Clans does. That you only get rewarded, or you get any kind of credits, upon winning a match. So you could spend, and you know... 40 minutes doing 30 different matches, but if you don't win any one of those, then you've just wasted time. It was one of those subtle things that I really liked about Gwent, that you don't have to win the match, you just have to win the round. And the thing, the beauty about Gwent is that if, as anyone who's played Gwent knows, that if someone goes all in on round one, chances are they're going to let round two go as a buy. So you're pretty much guaranteed to get some credit towards that second round, or towards your win percentage that way. But a lot of these mobile games, they just emphasize power above all else. So it doesn't matter if you play the game, because if you don't win, you get nothing for it. Eh. Yeah, again, the, Witchers, the Witcher series occupies that very weird area between RPG and a action game in terms of its mechanics. Did you have a chance to play Vampire yet, Elgordo? Oh, we are in peak summertime, folks. Allergies are flaring up, and it's going to be like a sweat lounge in here, too. But, uh, I was talking to other Josh about this, and the reason why we really see Command & Conquer Rivals is that it's being marketed as the super accessible strategy game, obviously on mobile. But the problem is that for any good that's in it, it's not going to be able to... One second. It's not going to be able to do anything more with its strategy design because it's being hampered by the monetization. And I just see the same thing happening with it that I see with South Park, that they're going to introduce new units, which are going to obviously be better, and it's just not, 
Yeah. No, allergies 15, Josh 0, I think is the more apt description there. But I don't see how they're going to really grow that experience. The same thing with South Park Phone Destroyer, which has had patches and updates, which have added in new cards. But again, it's just adding more to the monetization. Because you release a new card, well, now you got to collect more cards of that. And then you gotta get the resources to upgrade those cards. So I don't see how they're going to keep things sustained. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the idea of having the different generals is okay, but it's only for their general power, not for specific units. For anyone who played CNC generals, what I really liked about that game was the fact that when you apply a general, it changes the entire faction. So you have the Air Force General in for, I guess it was just considered USA at that time, so you get no ground units, but you get enhanced air units. Or the uh, Chinese uh, infantry side gets enhanced infantry, but no vehicles. So it's just a very interesting way of playing to those specific strengths, or those specific builds. Of course, it wouldn't work in a uh, eSport category. Yeah. And what's very telling is that they failed to learn the lesson from Command Conquer 4, which did something very similar with progression tied to match wins. And it, the funny thing, people have been saying that specific, and I actually saw this, specific unit types are not unlocked or you can't get them in the loot box until you hit specific levels. So it comes down to this. I get aircraft or air counters very early, but I can't get aerial units until I hit like level 5 or 6 on my account. But then what happens if I fight a level 5 or level 6 guy and I'm only level two, 3 or 4? Am I going to really be able to stand up to them? What if at level 5 they get some kind of super tank, but I can't do anything with it because I'm not at that level yet? And this is why leveling or using leveling as a gate for progression doesn't work with a strategy game, especially one that's built on very fine-tuned balance. Imagine playing a strategy game where at level 4 you get a new, let's say, rock class unit, but you don't get a new scissors unit until level 6. You kind of see the problem there, because how am I supposed to counter that unit when the abstraction is metaphorically against me? And that's what people didn't like about Command & Conquer 4, was that you level up, you unlock new researches, you unlock new units. So how do you counter that stuff if you're not able to reach that? And who wants to play a strategy game where three quarters of your toolbox are locked? Yeah, I know a lot of people don't like the sound of new Fallout. And hmm, I wonder if I could make that into a whole second uh, topic for today or just a video. We'll have to see how long I can rant about it. But, keeping with Command Conquerors and this general idea of strategy design on mobile, they're not really applying to the strategy genre because you're attaching that monetization. And when I was talking to Josh about this, I know why it's popular because it really applies, it really favors monetization. But, the point is it kind of comes at the expense of strategy. Just imagine if Blizzard tried to do something like this with StarCraft 3, or they release a mobile version of it. You're, how many people are going to be uh, ranting and raving over that one? But when it comes to strategy game design, as we've said before, the genre has sadly gone down by the wayside. And I'm really sorry about rubbing my nose so much. <sighs> But it is unfortunately peak uh, allergy, peak strategy season. There we go. <laughs> I'm allergic to strategy games. But the strategy genre has just not become that big bestseller. And wow, my ears just popped. And I think part of the problem has been the fact that the strategy genre, at least in its original capacity, failed to attract the esports market. As we all know, in the last decade, everybody tried to position a strategy game, especially EA, as the... Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. Everybody try to make a real-time strategy as a big eSport. So you saw this with the general micro-focus with series like Company of Heroes, Warhammer 40k, Command and & Conquer, and so on. I mean, unfortunately, games like Planetary Annihilation, Sup Supreme Commander, and so on, they didn't really work in an eSport. Because you can't really tell people to watch a match for 40 minutes to an hour when you're just focusing on that macro layer of, let's just look at this big old map and just watch the little units. People wanted to see everybody get animated and things blow up. And the micro focus also lent itself a lot better to MOBAs. But with EA, they really tried to push, I think it was starting with uh, Red Alert, I want to say 2, or Command Conquer 3, they really started to try and push things towards esports with their battle cast modes and stuff along those lines. And I'm going to mute my mic for one second while I need to do one heavy nose blow. I'll be right back. Oh boy, folks. Is it winter time yet? <laughs> but yeah, I really enjoyed Red Alert 2. And even to some extent, Red Alert 3 was alright. It did have a different approach to it, which again was heavily favored by the esports. They turned into a two on two match because they really wanted to get those co op. And EA felt that was going to be what separated them from StarCraft, which kind of had the one on one game completely locked down. Even Command & Conquer 4, wasn't that like 2 on 2 and 3 or 3 at that point? But again, it doesn't really lend itself towards a strategy when everybody's just massing units and it's one blob versus another. But, as at the end of last decade, we tried to see, or they attempted to reboot Age of Empires with AoEO. Exactly, chasing that money. And it had a great idea. They were trying to build off of the home city concept of Age of Empires 3, which I really liked, but I know a lot of people who hated that upgrade. They felt that, again, it put too much abstraction into the balance by saying, oh, we'll give you a symmetrical map, but this guy can summon, you know, an extra 2,000 gold five minutes in the map because he got the bonus gold announcement or a bonus cold upgrade or oh you don't have to worry about rush because I'll just spend my card and get 20 units for free yeah I'm kind of nervous about that because we haven't heard anything more about Age of Empires let's see uh, let's see here uh, nothing new so it's being developed by Relic Entertainment. And no really big announcements, sadly. Aww. And while it's great that it's being done by Relic, I hope they don't try and uh, Warhammer 40k it. Because I don't want hero units in my Age of Empires. Age of Mythology, that's a different story, but... I don't see that working in a colonial period. Speaking of, I know we did see announcements or we saw actual footage of Anno 1800. <laughs> Is Battletoads going to be the next great RTS game? <laughs> but seriously though, I am really excited about Battletoads just to see what they're going to do with it. The same goes for the Cuphead DLC. But, I guess to wrap up this first little section then, yeah, with Command and & Conquer and with strategy design as a whole, unfortunately it doesn't, it could work on mobile, I mean the touch interface works really well, but you cannot attach Peltoad's rival, there we go, but you cannot attach a pay to win system or a pay for power in a game that's supposed to have a heavy focus on balance and counters. Because traditionally, when you wanted to break that system, you would have units that would kind of alter its role, like a cavalry unit who was strong against spearmen, spearmen instead of archers. So essentially, essentially, the rock unit was strong against 
paper but weak against scissors if that makes any sense but when you start attaching power-ups and RPG progression it starts to break that rule if I level up my scissor unit enough can he counter rock units and if that's the case then what's the point of balance to begin with other than having a flimsy excuse to spend more and more money but with that said let's move on to a second topic 